Today, we're going to answer a very interesting question, which I've been asking myself for a very long time, which is if Elon Musk can be considered a 21st century embodiment of Nietzsche's Superman. We begin by quickly revisiting Nietzsche's Superman in order to have a definition for the unfolding analysis. Next, we're going to see how comic book heroes transformed the idea in the 20th century, followed by a comparison of Elon Musk with the tech version of Superman, Iron Man. Then we're going to ask ourselves if Elon Musk's Joker character is a consequence of authentic self-expression or a product of his Twitter addiction. You tweet a lot. I, I use my tweets to express myself. <laughs> we will discuss Twitter as a kind of matrix which motivates a certain self-representation and by extension, virtual identity. That which this channel is all about, right? Virtual identity. In the end, we're hopefully going to see how Nietzsche's Superman would actually act in the 21st century. In previous videos, we have defined Nietzsche's Übermensch, his Superman, as the peak of authenticity. The kind of person who overcomes their socialization, right? Inherited patterns of identity and collective expectations in order to challenge established modes of being and invent new values for themselves and the world at large. They become who they are, no matter what anybody thinks or says. They express themselves in complete independence of the like button, so to speak. That's authenticity. They don't care about society's notion of what is good, what is right, how one ought to act. And obviously, you know that there's a public perception. Nobody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising? Blackmail me with money? Go f*** yourself. But. Go f yourself. Is that clear? I hope it is. Hey, Bob, if you're in the audience. Well, well, let me ask you then. That's how I feel. They have their own ideas about good and evil, but not just theoretically as radical philosophers like Nietzsche, but practically as shapers and engineers of human destiny. Nietzsche's Superman is not governed by the collective moral code, but by his internal will to power. And this inner energy compels him to seek power in the external world in order to transform it in his image, right? He wants to impose his vision of the future on the world. In fact, he essentially wants to rule the world. I think if you define him this way, Nietzsche's Superman sounds completely like Elon Musk today, doesn't he? I mean, this is speculative, but I think if Elon Musk had been born in the US, he would probably by now already be a candidate for the US presidency. He would run as an independent, I would assume. And then he wouldn't just own America's digital town square, but he would be able to shape, you know, the rules of immigration, energy and space travel sitting in the White House. I mean, imagine that. I think he would have a very good chance at winning the elections to be honest. Who, kn who knows, maybe he's going to seek constitutional change down the road in order to admit, you know, US immigrants to become president one day. I don't know. So what about the American Superman, you know, from comic books and movies? Well, somewhat ironically, the first Superman draft appeared in January 1933, the same month Hitler seized power in Germany to wait for it, transvalue all values. However, not just Christian values like the commandment, you shall not kill, but also the core values of the entire Western Enlightenment, like free speech, democracy, inclusive economics and human dignity. It was titled the reign of the Superman. Originally, the character was not an American hero fighting for the liberty of the oppressed, but a fascist villain ruthlessly expressing his will to power over others, disregarding any traditional ideas of good and evil. In a way, he was not only inspired by a German mind, Nietzsche, but also mirrored Germany's acting out of the idea under the leadership of Hitler, prior to being converted into an American role model guided by traditional Christian morality. Of course, Superman has alien supernatural abilities like flight, superhuman strength or X-ray vision. And in this sense, he's much more of a Darwinian instead of a Nietzschean Superman characterized by superiority in physique rather than spirit, so to say. He's not an average human who overcomes his socialization in order to invent new values. He's a physical Superman, thanks to Kryptonian biology, not due to exerting his will to power over his own self. 
But there is another way of attaining power in the post-Christian world. We could say the opposite of nature or biology, which would inspire other versions of the Superman in the comic book universe. Indeed, Nietzsche's Übermensch as symbol of ultimate authenticity and the will to power kind of seemed to find its embodiment in the 20th century comic book figures of tech billionaires like Iron Man and Batman, rather than Superman. In a world where technology has been a symbol of power since the first atomic bombs, these characters embody the Nietzschean Superman concept. They have the financial means to create tools that let them shape their own destinies, overcoming both physical and social barriers. Their technological skills allow them to profoundly change values. As we all know, the computer-powered internet revolution has shown to be incredibly transformative, changing society at large. Some would say for the better. Some would say the original intentions and expectations have been betrayed. Technology is creatively destructive, and the consequences of new innovations are therefore hardly predictable and very hard to categorize. The internet has destroyed structures we valued, but it also created new value structures. I'm not referring to stock market valuations of firms like Google or Meta, but to that which we value internally, our internal psychological value hierarchy, if you will. And such internal impact makes sense given that the internet and the software through which we engage with each other does not even exist in any tangible manner in the physical world, but is confined to a virtual realm. In some sense, the internet exists in a sort of mental realm, in a sort of mental dimension connecting humanity. Animals have no access to this world. As a direct consequence, the software interfaces we use to connect mentally with each other have the power to frame human discourse, psychology and cognition at unprecedented and unbelievable scales. Unfortunately, the democratization of access to and production of information though driven by enlightenment values like free speech and self-determination, has actually led to a digital realm resembling medieval and 20th century totalitarian structures. New media powers determine what can and what cannot be said online, while an oligarchy of attention brokers monopolize revenues from advertisements. What's more, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page or Elon Musk are perfectly capable of not just conditioning human self-perception and behavior over time, but of shaping human attention in the present. A change in the Facebook, YouTube or Twitter algorithm may shift an entire country's focus of attention in the media and by direct extension, transform its politics. From the Arab Spring to wokeism, it is clear that culture has been strongly influenced by the new media, but these media in turn are shaped by tech corporations who are either governed by their shareholders' profit motive or by the will to power of an individual. In this sense, we could say that the Superman of Nietzsche's philosophy takes on a tangible form in the tech billionaires of the 21st century. But, but let's just pause here for a second to observe the simplicity of the argument. If we pretend that technology is power and Nietzsche's Superman is he who is closest to such power in order to change the world and well collective values then yes Elon Musk and company are essentially Superman not physically like you know the Kryptonian Superman but, but certainly financially and even technologically in terms of their ability to change the world at large sometimes even by means of pushing a button they can do that as they see fit there's no one to there's no oversight board at twitter there's no one who holds elon musk accountable to the kind of changes he implements it's his company even though it's everybody's digital town square supposedly he's the one who rules he's a king dictator if you want tyrant or free speech hero prometheus so yeah Elon Musk in particular stands out as a modern incarnation of this money-enabled tech superman. Through his ventures in SpaceX, Tesla and other groundbreaking projects like Neuralink or Boring, Musk embodies the superman's drive and ability to transcend limitations and shape the future. However, and that's the irony of this story, Elon Musk's identity, unlike that of Nietzsche's superman, actually remains externally engineered.
if there are two futures and one future is we're out there among the stars and the things we read about and see in science fiction movies, the good ones are true. We have these starships and we're, we sh we're going to see what other planets are like and we're a multi-planet species and the scope and scale of consciousness has expanded across m many civilizations and many planets and many star systems. This is a great future. This is a wonderful thing to me, and that's what we should strive for. It's not a product of his inner authenticity or the voice of his inner God. You see, by reading comic books and science fiction novels as a kid and as an adolescent, he effectively became an actor playing out the Iron Man character in his sci-fi inspired vision of humanity becoming a multiplanetary species in the future. In other words, both his character and his goals, his dreams, have been shaped by novels and comic books and movies by the media. It's time to go back to the moon, this time to stay. By the same token, Jeff Bezos, the other space explorer, aspired to building a rocket company ever since he watched the moon landing with his grandparents as a little boy. You may be familiar with this story. In his case, we can say that state propaganda has shaped his dream, while in the case of Elon Musk, we have to admit that writers have much more power to shape human destiny than some might be willing to admit. We could say that Plato was right all along. Poets are the ultimate engineers of human destiny, as fictional characters shape human identity. This twist highlights the complex interplay between authenticity and external influences, demonstrating that even those who appear to embody Nietzsche's Superman may still be shaped by the narratives and ideals they encounter in the media. The line between self-creation and being the product of engineering by the media, mediatic identity engineering, are rather blurred in the 21st century. It's not clear to me that anybody can say for themselves to be the product of their inner voice of God, their inner authenticity. I call it voice of God because it's like, what else is it, right? Th this ultimate power. So let's quickly reformulate the argument against Elon Musk being Nietzsche's Superman. It basically goes like this. If power is the ability to create one's identity from within, to become who one is, transcending previous patterns of being in the real world and in the fictional world or the literary world, then no, Elon Musk is no Nietzschean Superman because he, he resembles patterns of being which we encounter in the media. In fact, I think we could go so far and claim that his identity is a product of the media. I think when you read his biography, well, Walter Isaacson's um, biography it becomes rather clear that he was very, very profoundly inspired by comic books and sci-fi novels and that he essentially lived in a fantasy world when he was a little boy and that that's what he dreamt of living out in reality later in life and which he, to some extent, is making happen by, by means of SpaceX. So to me, it's kind of ironic because Plato is very big on poets having the ability to engineer human character and then you get someone like elon musk who's literally called by people the real iron man i mean it's just it's funny and i think at this point we should all very much ask ourselves what kind of story we are a product of or what kind of stories we are influenced by i think nietzsche very much fought against protestant christianity which was that which had sort of programmed his character i think when he grew up, they even called him the little priest because he was the son of a priest. And I think we, I think it's fair to say, I've made this point before in dramatized form, and it was a bit tongue in cheek, but I think it's actually fair to say that the church, both the Catholic and later the Protestant, I mean, the church in itself is a sort of media outlet. It's a network of, what is it? Medi mediatic, rep me it's, a, it's a network of reproduction facilities for a very, very limited media diet, the Bible. With the rituals, I think it becomes a sort of multi-sensorial, well, real world virtual reality that you kind of 
act out in order to ideally embody this ideal human being, you know, the Christian Superman, Jesus Christ. And it, it, I think that process was very effective. It worked. The Christian worldview and, and self-image ruled the Western world for a very, very long time. And you may argue that that's because, I mean, I think theists or Christians may argue that that's because Christianity is true. And atheists would argue, no, it's because there was no competitor, like there was no free speech and information was not able to travel very quickly, something which only happened once the Gutenberg press was invented. And all of a sudden you get this network of scientists, philosophers, schools, which overthrows the Catholic media empire. Well, the Catholic media empire was already in Germany, was already overthrown by, by the Lutheran Reformation, which was enabled by technology. Without technology, without the Gutenberg press, the Catholic Church, well, that's all speculative. But it's like, but the point here is, you know, whether it's Christianity or something else, the point is, even if you had the truth, in order to scale it, you need a media network. And that's what the church was. And now you don't have a media network anymore. You don't have a network of churches, which everybody attends. But well, until recently, prior to streaming, you had a network of movie theaters, instead of the body of Christ, well, it was Superman or Star Wars, or whatever. Now you do it at home. And so previously, people became Christians by imitating the, the biblical Superman. And now people become Iron Man by imitating post Christian representations of the Superman in comic books. It's just to me, it's just completely ironic. So if you accept this premise that we are engineered by poets or by the media, you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of matrix are you plugged into? You know, like what kind of bookshelf, what kind of media diet shapes your worldview and, you know, your self image was, which is ultimately always, at least to a large extent influenced by these kind of sources of information. They orient you, they, they enable you to locate yourself within the world, and they shape your behavior by extension. We see that as much in conspiracy theories as in political movements, you know. And so yeah, I wrote down these questions. I mean, it's crazy if you ask yourself, what kind of fictional representations of reality shape your worldview? What kind of non fictional representations of reality shape your worldview? And if we are what we eat, if we are a product of our personalized media feed, well, what ought to be on the menu? What ought to be at the top of it, at the top of the attention hierarchy in the media? It's a very deep question. If it's no longer Christ, if it's not the state of Germany or the Soviet Union, what is it, Elon Musk? Because he certainly is on Twitter. Deep question, deep technological problem. But of course, that's not all. It's not, we're not just a product of media consumption. Our self, our identity is not just shaped by what we consume it. It's also shaped by the technology we use to express ourselves. That's what this series is about. This is like the idea of profilicity is that it's a product to large extent of corporate organizations. It's essentially a consequence of how we organize ourselves socially. The corporation, in my experience, and theoretical understanding creates the profile, which you can game, you can act as if you were you can represent yourselves, you can represent yourself as a productive, and loyal member of your company, even though you're not, and you can be promoted based on that image, rather than on your authentic productivity, and feelings about the company you work for for example. And then in social media, it's the same thing, you can represent yourself through filters and staged photos at locations as a happy traveling person, when in reality, you're like you live in your mom's basement, and you're just miserable, you know what I mean? So th th the first question is, what kind of matrix are you plugged into? What, you know, what are you absorbing about what kind of information about the world are you absorbing? And what kind of media matrix channels your identity, and thereby frames it. 
So let me just read this. In the last, so in the last episode, we saw how the YouTube algorithm mirrors primal perceptual and motivational circuitry of the human brain and how Mr. Beast in turn optimizes his content for maximal resonance with this incentive structure governing the attention hierarchy of the YouTube matrix. And that was in juxtaposition with Nietzsche's absolute creative freedom provided by, well, the technology of writing. I mean, there's no real interface between you and your self-expression, you could say. And there's no, there's no statistical analysis. You don't get any analytics about how your text has performed, right? If it's just about production, independent of distribution, obviously his books sold poorly. I think, you know, he printed like a thousand copies of Thus Spake Zarathustra, which he thought was the new Bible, and it sold like 50 copies. And he got feedback via letter where people were like, okay, yeah, what the fuck is this man? Like what kind of, what kind of mental drama is going on in your world? I mean, you should, maybe you should come down from the mountains. I think that's roughly how he could characterize the reception of Dusbeck's or of his work in general, his later work in general. So Nietzsche was like in the mountains on top of the Alps and he was completely free in his self-expression. His inner voice was not framed. It was not mitigated by any cybernetic structure like the YouTube algorithm or the Twitter algorithm for that matter because because we'll, we'll see in a minute how Elon Musk's self-expression is heavily influenced by code by, by this by this interface by this attention distributing mechanism which he's gaming it's a game Nietzsche was playing no game I mean he was playing the self-knowledge and self-representation game but I think we it's fair to say that he was doing that independent largely uh, I would say almost 90%, if not 99% governed by his inner motivation rather than by external incentives or influences. Whereas the whole thing, that was kind of the point of the last episode, the, the whole thing just has been completely inverted in the 20th century with, with media distribution and by extension production becoming subordinated to the profit motive. Well, if you sudden, you don't write what you authentically want to say and you possibly don't even go on a authentic self-expression journey to figure out what you want to write about or represent in the media and movies or books. But you do that which the market demands. And so you kind of, what is it? You, you scream into the forest and the way it screams back, like that's what you're going to enter a feedback loop with. You know, you, you get captured by your audience, by your target audience, by your market by your customers and then you serve them you become a slave in in some sense right well that does not happen when you live nowhere and you know by yourself in in the alps in your own little matrix but of course I'm not saying that nietzsche's lifestyle and the way he created was ideal because i mean he was by himself if there's no connection to the zeitgeist to the spirit of his time if he if he's unable to reach people in the present, he can't change. He can't have an impact on them. And even assuming that through him, the voice of God or the voice of the Superman was speaking at the time, well, it was kind of a waste because it, it didn't reach anybody. Also, another point from last time where it's like, okay, Nietzsche's Superman can't actually express himself authentically because he has to adapt himself to the vocabulary of his time and also to the moral code like to the YouTube community guidelines, if he wants to speak on YouTube. Or the, well, now maybe not so much on Twitter, but on Twitter, it's the same thing, actually. Elon Musk claims there's freedom of speech, but of course, he also says that freedom of speech ain't freedom of reach. So what is it now? I can say what I think, but it doesn't reach anybody. So I'm still stuck in my own matrix. It's like, who determines what ought to gain reach? Big problem. Big incentive structure challenge so back to elon musk and obviously you know that there's a public perception nobody's gonna try to blackmail me with advertising blackmail me with money go f yourself here's the thing since his identity is strongly tied to his twitter profile it is not clear if he is acting authentically 
or if his identity has already been captured by his audience slash the Twitter algorithm. Last time we equated, I think that was one of Mr. Beast's claim and other people at YouTube claim the same thing that replace the word algorithm with audience. It's not that the algorithm doesn't like your video. It's that the audience doesn't like your video supposedly but of course maybe the algorithm just fed it to the wrong audience which didn't like the video which is why the video is being suppressed that's the problem how do you know like i'm asking myself that very question it's like who am i targeting it's like i don't fucking know like i don't know people like me you know it's it's not that clear so if the first 100 who click on the video don't watch it well, then the video just, it won't be shown to anybody anymore. The algorithm can't figure out whom to show it to. Well, who are you going to show Nietzsche's Superman to? Imagine Nietzsche's Das Speck Zarathustra on YouTube, a book for everyone and no one, or a video for everyone and no one. Like, literally. It's like, who's it going to reach? Actually, I should try that out. I should, like, call it a book for every, a video for everyone and no one, and then see if the algorithm is, to, is smart enough to show it to everyone, because that's what I want it to be shown to. Everyone. Same with Nietzsche completely stupid argument that I'm just making up. But you know what I mean? It's like, Das Beck Zarathustra is like a book for one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in a 100,000, who knows, and it can be something completely different to each one of the readers who feel resonance with his words. So it's like, how are you supposed to distribute that? Big problem, very big problem. I've been thinking about attention hierarchies for years. And it's Anyways, so Elon Musk and Twitter, authentic self-expression or Twitter algorithm framed self-expression. Does he really say, does he really express himself how he feels or does he do it because the Twitter incentive structure motivates a certain kind of self-expression in him and many other people who are susceptible to being drawn into a feedback loop with the kind of feedback you get. We'll get to something very interesting in a minute about this. So anyways, those are the questions. Does he do it for the likes, retweets and memes? His followers will create driven by second order observation. Does he attempt to create exhibition value in the spirit of profilicity? And then another question I wrote down here is why does he try to boost his profile as an authentic Promethean free speech revolutionary instead of his profile as sincere CEO of various companies, given the impact his tweets can have on their valuations? It's another question, right? It's like Tesla, I think Tesla is the company with the largest percentage of retail investors, so normal people like you and me instead of investment funds, in, in, instead of institutional investors, okay? Tesla is getting so much exposure, it's getting so much attention through him on Twitter. Well, it exists in people's mind as this world changing company with infinite potential. And in some sense, Twitter is like this, this amplification machine of the Tesla myth. Tesla is to a large extent a myth. It's like, if you look at what the business actually is, it's like pretty bad or it's okay-ish. Now it's better than it was like two or three years ago when for for very good reasons, people bet, people bet on its bankruptcy. But there's always like the story element on it. Story is very important. I'm a behavioral economist by education, essentially. It's like most market movements, most market trends are driven by not by rationality, but by fantasy. So Let's see some examples. Somebody's gonna try to blackmail me with advertising? Blackmail me with money? Go f yourself. Here, well, here I think Musk fans may claim that this kind of behavior is authentic. A rebellion against sincerity, we could say, to speak with Professor Murdo's categories of identity. But going back to profilicity, we may have to challenge this perspective on a very fundamental basis. You tweet a lot. I, I use my tweets to express myself. <laughs> Some people use their hair. I use Twitter. So this is a fact. Elon knows, he admits that Twitter mediates his self-expression or actually his communication with the world. Twitter or x.com 
It's essentially an Elon humanity interface. Well, but you use your tweeting to, to kind of get back at critics. You Rarely. Have, you kind of have little wars with the press. Twitter is a war zone. If somebody's going to jump in the war zone, it's like, okay, you're in the arena. Let's go. Okay. Who does that sound like? I don't know. Who's this sound like? It sounds like a guy who lives at the White House. Oh, that guy. Yeah, sure. He's very good at Twitter. <laughs> I know. I, I think the uh, president is amazingly good at Twitter. <laughs> this is crazy. I mean, the guy knows it's a game. He knows it. He, well, back in the day, I, don't, I think that interview is like four years old, probably. I mean, Trump was still president. And he calls it a war game. It's crazy. And, you know, a war game similar to the kind of um, shooters, video shooters he grew up with, uh, Xbox, PlayStation, whatever, computers back then. Um, the difference being, of course, that instead of shooting bullets, you shoot insults, jokes, memes, and other forms of verbal attack. He has an addiction, I'll just pick one example, to tweeting. Yes. You know, and tweeting conspiracy theories and weird things. And it only happens in those rare times when he gets into his dark demon mode late at night on Ambien and Red Bull, and he embraces some Breakfast wacky... Breakfast of champions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he embraces some wacky, you know, Paul Pelosi or yeah. uh, Anthony Fauci, and then... There was the one recently that people said was anti-Semitic, but it was so confusing, the conspiracy theory, I don't even think he quite, but it was just reposting just these threw it things. threw out there, yeah. <sighs> so here's what I wrote. I realize I'm completely deviating from the script, but I think that's, that's probably good. It's kind of devastating that we have to consider the discourse on the so-called digital town square, a verbal war game for attention where the rewards which you can reap are likes, retweets, and any other form of engagement. <laughs> well, devastating or hilarious, I mean, it's just completely, completely insane. I mean, imagine we were to play this game on our hometown's market square, we would probably be all locked up for disturbing the public peace or something. It's like, literally, without invitation, just scream your opinion at random people in the street. I mean, that's what Twitter is. It's so fucking retarded. Who the fuck built this machine? Who the fuck allows it to be running and to be run by Elon Musk? It's insane. Stop it. Oh, man. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay. Okay. Back to, back to the script. So, um, we affirmed that Twitter is a game. A war game fought with words kind of like rap actually which motivates the kind of self-expression which maximizes collective engagement that's very important you have to maximize collective engagement in order to trigger well engagement is already is your ability to trigger a reaction a thumb reaction um by means of words and then we have to affirm that he's addicted to this game <laughs> and he's playing it under the influence. What could go wrong, Elon? Elon Musk is on trial starting today because of some of his old tweets. Investors are suing in federal court because he posted about a potential Tesla buyout that would have taken the company private. But that never happened, and the company's stock dropped. If the court rules in favor of the investors, Musk and Tesla could be forced to pay billions in damages. Holy shit. Now, the question is, how does the Twitter war game for attention impact Elon Musk's identity? Like, that's the question, right? Like, so forget about the idea of Elon Musk being Superman. No, his identity is under the spell of Twitter, period. So what does it do? So I wrote down the summary of a newspaper article, New York Times article by Jaron Lanier, I'm a big fan of Jaron Lanier, all his books behind me. I think he wrote four, four books, brilliant. He's essentially my mentor in the, in the world of computer science and AI, because I have no idea about it like what computer science is like what is code i don't know i don't zeros plus ones i don't i don't understand anything about that i actually have programmer friends who tell me a lot about it but you know like i try to think above computer science so i can categorize it and there's basically two categories long story short that's not what i'm planning to get into but it's basically two schools there's the technologist school i would call it that way or you know, the, those who suffer from science fiction and just schizophrenia, who believe that AI will be God, essentially the world is created by, is, 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 is a computer and, you know, computers are the incarnations. That's Ray Kurzweil comes out of, what's his face? Um, 
I always get the first name wrong, Marvin Minsky. There's Hyman Minsky as well, but he's an economist. He's great. But Marvin Minsky, Marvin Minsky was an MIT professor of computer science at the same time that Joseph or Josef Weizenbaum was a computer scientist at MIT and invented Eliza, which was sort of the first Siri. And those two, both Jewish, just saying that because it's interesting, and Weizenbaum's German Jew, I think he left at the age of nine. Um, and the Weizenbaum Institute is actually a great institution in Berlin. But anyway, so those two, they spark like two schools of thought, the technologists and Ray Kurzweil becomes, I think, the greatest representative of that school. And people like Larry Page and all, you know, they basically place AI above humanity. It's like the next stage of evolution, blah, 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 stupidity. And then there's the humanist school, which is Weizenbaum. And then Jaron Lanier, who was, by the way, big friend of Minsky and somehow always went against him talks about that a lot and he writes about that a lot so that part of the history of mind history of ideas i think is highly interesting anyways lanier invents vr and when you read him it becomes clear that i i mean if there's a hierarchy of technological thinkers in the world to me i don't know all of them but you know i look at the likes of max techmark and I mean, I've been listening to the AI podcast that was the original title of the Lex Friedman podcast since 2017. And um, yeah, I mean, most of them are fall into the category of technologists, which is ironic. I mean, Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel's diagnosis is, you know, it's a sort of vanity complex that actually they believe computer science is the source code of reality because that elevates computer scientists to representatives of God, essentially. Long story short, Lanier, I mean, the guy is just a machine. I, I mean, there's an article about him where people call him a Mozart, you know, a Da Vinci of our time. The, the guy is a fucking virtuoso. He's a genius. He invented VR, which essentially allows us to, without that, I mean, he invented VR. A friend of him wrote a book called The Neuromancer, based on which the Matrix movie was made, which is, of course, a visual representation or, or a motion picture representation of Plato's allegory of the cave, which kind of, you know, it's ironic because Lanier's technology basically s scales Platonism, dualism. Like there's a world of, like this world is illusory and, you know, well, Plato's opinion about the body is kind of problematic, but basically that there are two worlds. And of course, technologists think that this world is a simulation run by a computer and humanists think that this world is a simulation run by consciousness probably is what we would say long story short here is my summary of lanier who i'm highly who i highly respect and wh whom i admire his analysis of what twitter does to He's been talking about that for a long time. He wrote a book called 10 Reasons to Delete Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. And he's been and his first book was called You Are Not a Gadget, which was against this whole technologist view that, you know, consciousness is an illusion and you're a robot and you have no free will and blah, 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 blah. Long story short, he wrote this article in late 2022 about Trump, Kanye West and Elon Musk and what it does. I mean, you should read this article, but here's here's my relatively short summary. Let me read it to you. In his analysis, Lanier invokes the principles of operant conditioning pioneered by behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner. It's not funny, but it's just like the idea that Twitter or any social media platform is a Skinner box, so basically an animal cage on which the, the architects of the platform perform um, experiments which are similar to the kind of experiments behaviorists played did with animals. I mean, it's just kind of insane. So anyway, so yeah. So Lanier invokes the principles of operant conditioning pioneered by behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner, Skinner, you know, from The Simpsons, to elucidate dynamics of social media addiction, particularly on platforms like Twitter. Lanier draws parallels between uh, between Skinner, sorry, but Lanier draws parallels between Skinner's early experiments, which involved providing animals with positive and negative stimuli to influence behavior, and the algorithmic mechanisms employed by social media platforms to engage users. It's fucked up. He equates social media platforms with Skinner boxes, the cages in which the behaviorist experimented on rats and pigeons. Lanier applies this framework to Elon Musk's behavior on Twitter, where Musk, once regarded as a serious entrepreneur, 
primarily focused on technological innovation and business development, has become prone to amplifying controversial stories and engaging in trivial disputes. Musk's transformation, akin to the behavioral shifts observed in personalities like Donald Trump and Kanye West, reflects the effects of social media conditioning, where the constant reinforcement of social validation and attention-seeking fosters addictive behavior. Great. I mean, you have to get people addicted because if not, they go to a different platform and you need them on screen as much as possible in order to monetize their eyeballs. By framing Musk's engagement on Twitter within the context of operant conditioning, Lanier highlights how the platform exploits these behavioral principles to reinforce and amplify certain behaviors contributing to what he terms Twitter poisoning. So Kemble, his brother, Antonio Grassi, his other friends sitting around, they're saying, if we could only take his Twitter feed away, if we could only put an impulse control button on him so he would not do these. And he even says, when asked, what's your biggest regret? He said, well, I keep shooting myself in the foot by yeah. tweeting. If you could take with an impulse control button that away, how great, well, not how great, but it's how much better how he much would better be. How much better it would be. Fantastic. Okay, um, I don't know if I can wing this because, okay, so what's Lanier's core claim here? I would say on a high level that social media platforms frame self-expression, right? There's, a, there's an interface, there's like this filter, it's a filter. They motivate a certain form of speech, explosive, impulsive, provocative speech on Twitter and condition you to engage in it over and over again optimizing the content of your posts or videos in the case of Mr. Beast for that which the algorithm will distribute at scale. That's why Lanier equates Twitter with a Skinner box. If you do what the platform wants, you get dopamine. If you do not, you get ignored. Personally, okay, personally, yeah, I like this idea of social media platforms being Skinner boxes, animal cages controlled by a a behaviorist algorithm. Why am I saying that I like this idea? I don't like the idea at all. I like the image of it because it's drastic, because it's dramatic, because it's, I think, intuitive and it's disgusting, which hopefully triggers an emotional reaction, perhaps even action against such platforms. Anyways, it did in me anyways. I'm building a competitive platform. I'm building a competitive platform right now. I'm, I'm stuck in one of these cages right now. However, I prefer to think of it as the matrix. True, I think of the YouTube as a matrix where you can create virtual identities of yourself or a virtual identity of yourself, which can become detached from who you really are and becomes more attached to the, to the algorithm or the particular audience you enter into a feedback loop with, right? Kind of like Hitler. Um, any poet, actually, any poet gets feedback from the audience, like that's what comedians do. They go on tour. And, you know, they, they try out a lot of things, and then there's feedback and that sort of that attention, you know, the, the feedback they get essentially is like the natural selection process of their content. And then they just aggregate the best, the jokes which get the best feedback into a, a total for a while I was following a lot of humorists and comedians and I studied them and like active callback and, and those kind of things. It's like they're storytellers and you know, there's like this compound nature of telling jokes. And it's like, I studied that for a while and the process makes sense. I think it's somewhat similar. I mean, it's similar to, to musicians who publish albums and then they get feedback. I mean, they're hits, right? They hit something, there's the deep resonance. And then at shows, they mostly play, the hits. It's like if you go to an Eminem concert, for example, the guy is one of the most prolific artists, if not the most prolific artist of the 21st century, he mostly plays successful songs, even though, even though there are great songs, better songs, possibly, on more recent albums, which have just not gained the same kind of attention. And we equate attention with resonance, even though that's probably false. There could be a higher resonance with other songs if they got more attention. But the question is, why do you get some songs more attention than others? You could say there's something like immediate resonance, which gets amplified. That's the thing. It's like if there's like a song that gets immediate resonance by a certain group, and then there's this whole 
mimetic desire feedback loop going on where like people listen to that which other people listen to because they want to be part of the conversation then that amplifies the initial resonance even though the song may not even resonate with people as much as other songs which were initially ignored big problem actually big problem big societal problem which requires a technological solution okay so what am, what else am i saying here i prefer to think of any media platform right now as a matrix yeah or any media technology actually even books yeah well in terms of self-expression a book is not i mean also frames your self-expression obviously because it reduces it to the inner voice and to left to right and it's like the problems with writing you can't represent everything with writing there's levels there are dimensions which are not captured by writing like music for example voice like how it sounds like you can describe how it ought to sound like poets who like say oh then he screamed you know with a red face something like that it's not the same anyways let's 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 close slowly but certainly in the last video we saw how the youtube matrix effectively motivated the emergence of mr beast as its attention king yeah true we did in this video, we saw how the comic book and sci-fi matrix shaped Elon Musk and how his self has since been captured by the structure of the Twitter matrix. I hope we saw that, right? I think we saw that. But in the first video of the series, we saw how the Gutenberg revolution released the grip of the Christian matrix over the Western mind, allowed Nietzsche to leave the matrix to return with the infinite ideal of the Superman. So what would the actual Superman do? And I think, I think it's self-evident that he would motivate a matrix which, no, he would build a matrix which would motivate people to become who they really are instead of that which they are not. Like what else would he be doing? Like first of all, he would become who he is. Like Nietzsche would become, he would go into the mountains. He would climb on top of the mountains, become who he is. And then would come back. And of course he could adapt to YouTube and become, you know, the philosopher beast and <laughs> spread his gospel of the Superman. But he would probably be ignored. So he, he would probably have to build an alternative where his content would rise to the top of attention and meritocratically so, of course. Well, unless, I mean, he could buy Twitter. If he had money, he could, he could buy Twitter and then he would be at the top of attention. But would it be sustainable? I think he, he would need to build a platform which would make it, which would make the productions of Superman or Supermanly or Superman like self expression. What I'm saying? I'm saying that <sighs> Superman needs to reach the top of the attention hierarchy because he's governed by the will to power and he wants to transvalue all values. He looks down on humanity. He's God, essentially, right? And he wants to change the value hierarchy, the value structure of the collective in the image of, of his own individual value structure, which he has, which, which he has discovered upon becoming who he really is. Let's put it this way. So how would he do that? I mean, he could impose it like he could he could become Stalin or Hitler and just impose his vision of man on his country. It's not clear to me that he would last very long. Right. And if the Superman is also this transcendent ideal, this transcendental being, I would almost say it's not that the Superman exists in a world beyond beyond, but he's always in some sense, he's always one incarnation ahead of us. Like even if I was a Superman, there would be a there would be a higher Superman after me. Like that's the high that's the the whole idea is evolution, right? The Übermensch is the trans. It's actually the better translation is actually transhuman because he transcends current incarnations of human beings, current versions of men, and so the the next greater man is is always always exists in the future. So you wanna. If you are the Superman, and th this is kind of crazy, if you identify with all future Superman, so the eternal Superman, 
he always is, but ever becomes greater. Well, you want to secure the um, the future emergence of greater versions of yourself if you're the Superman. So I think naturally the, that's the I think that's the argument. The only way to do that is in order is by means of building revolutionizing the media landscape such that this poetic process will be the most competitive poetic process. I, I, don't, I don't think you can do it by force. I think you have to do it by, by means of competitive prowess in the world of business. So good luck, Elon Musk. Um, I don't think you can do it. Okay, so a few last words. Surprisingly, that's really going to sound very ironic to those of you who are familiar with Plato's, Re Plato's Republic and the conflict between Nietzsche and Plato. Because this means that Nietzsche Superman would have to play philosopher king and define the kind of poetry slash media which would most likely engineer Superman within this new media matrix. Why? Well, for the sake of self-reproduction, obviously. In order to bring about, wait for it, the reign of the real Superman. Anyways. Let's close this trilogy on Nietzsche and the media with the continuation of my rewriting of Nietzsche's myth of the three transformations. As our empowered lion continued to embrace their inner child, a profound transformation took place. They no longer saw the digital realm as a battleground, but as a canvas for innovation and self-expression. With a childlike sense of wonder, they began to envision a future where technology served as a powerful tool for personal growth and collective empowerment. Drawing upon their newfound creativity, our lion embarked on a mission to create a technological dragon like no other. Unlike the oppressive digital dragons of the past, this one was designed to nurture and elevate individuals. It would provide a platform for self-discovery, breathing life into the cybernetically controlled camels awakening their latent potential. As they connected with this benevolent dragon, they too experienced a metamorphosis. The camels shed their burdensome online profiles and began to transform into lions, standing tall with newfound strength and determination. They roared with authenticity and courage, ready to face the challenges of the digital era. They too reconnected with their inner children and tapped into their innate curiosity and creativity turning the digital realm into a playground of endless possibilities. And as the lion children continued to evolve, they eventually became fathers and mothers of this new digital age. They guided and nurtured the next generation, instilling in them the values of self-discovery, authenticity, and empowerment, allowing them to assume cosmic responsibility in the spirit of eternal sincerity. In this reimagined world, the technological dragon no longer oppressed but empowered. It became a symbol of hope and transformation, a testament to the enduring human spirit. The cycle of growth and self-realization continued as each generation passed on the legacy of this transformative dialectic between authenticity and sincerity. And so, in the digital era of the 21st century, a new narrative unfolded. It was a story of resilience, creativity, and the endless potential of the human spirit to embrace responsibility in the face of technological challenges.